Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back to our uh, Ramadan Halakha series on Islamic Theology 101 with Dr. Fari Al Salam uh, of the American Islamic College in Chicago, Illinois. Um, the goal of our series, Islamic Theology 101, is to deepen our understanding of the history of Islamic theology from the earliest days of Islam to the impact it's had on how we understand Islam today. Uh, and in, uh, this is the third uh, of four um, episodes, inshallah, or four, se uh, four sessions uh, for this series. And today's session covers tradition and leadership. Uh, again, our previous sessions are recorded, and you can find them on the Muslim Space uh, YouTube channel. So if you go to muslimspace.org, you can access our Ramadan resource page uh, and be able to connect and see our previous recordings, um, as well as see all the other activities that we have going on during Ramadan. We're really uh, excited and grateful to Dr. Salem for coming back again um, for uh, the third session. And inshallah, we're looking forward to seeing uh, what, uh, what more gems we can kind of get uh, as, we, as we dive into uh, this ocean of Islamic theology with Dr. Salem. And uh, Dr. Salem's bio is in, will be in the description of the video. So um, needs no further introduction there, uh, but we'd like to maximize the time that we have with Dr. Salem. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Salem um, to, to the virtual stage here. Salam alaikum, Dr. Salem. Alaikum as -salam. Thank you for having me uh, this third session. I'm, again, really excited to speak with all of you. Um, today's topic will be tradition and leadership, and more precisely, I'm going to be doing comparative Sunni and Shia theology, and so looking at some parts of early Islamic history, and then thinking about how um, Sunnis and Shias have interpreted various events. <clears throat> So I'm going to um, share my screen with all of you. All right. And let me begin with a dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Allahumma allimna bima yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Okay. Um, so our topic today is tradition and leadership, and we're going to look at uh, comparative Sunni Shia um, theology here. And this is a miniature here of seeking a fatwa, and it's an Ottoman miniature. Okay, so let's begin by looking at uh, early Islamic history after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the Caliph uh, Omar takes charge of the Muslim community. He leads the Muslim community. And he was caliph for only two years, but these were a really crucial two years. Um, during the lifetime of Abu Bakr, during his um, leadership, the Quran is collected into one single volume. It had been recorded and preserved in previous um, versions before, both in written form and uh, in memory through Hafs. Uh, the, uh, Abu Bakr uh, commissioned a, a group under the leadership of Zayd ibn Thabit to collect the entire Quran into one volume. Abu Bakr also keeps the Muslims in Arabia unified when um, a group of Muslims refuse to pay their taxes and they um, uh, these are the Arab tribes uh, who refuse to pay taxes. And so Abu Bakr is really one of the, he is the key figure in his leadership that keeps the Arabian Peninsula unified under the banner of Islam after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. He sends troops um, in what's known as the Ridda Wars or the Ridda Battles. And um, this, uh, this is a um, crucially strategic move that keeps the Muslim community uh, from falling apart after the Prophet Muhammad passes away. <clears throat> and we're, we see this is how Islam began to expand after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. So we see uh, the dark green is during the lifetime of the Prophet, and then during Abu Bakr, the entirety of the Arabian Peninsula uh, comes under the leadership of Islam. And then um, under Omar and Osman, uh, the Islamic community really spreads uh, far and wide in, in a way that's just really incredible. 
uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab follows uh, Abu Bakr and um, under Umar, Muslim lands expand to an unprecedented rate and they also take former uh, Sasanian and Byzantine empires. Two thirds of these uh, of the Byzantine empire come under Muslim uh, control. Um, uh, Omar allows for free worship in Jerusalem by Jews and Monophysite Christians. Um, and in Sasanian lands, Zoroastrians were also allowed to worship freely. Uh, sources uh, report that the, hand, the keys of Jerusalem were handed over peacefully to Omar and that there was a pact between the um, communities in that region, which Omar conquered in greater Syria and uh, the Muslim community under the leadership of Omar. Um, it's important to understand the monophysite, diaphysite um, differences that were happening at this time. So, um, um, so the monophysites believed in one nature of Christ, whereas the diaphysites believed that Jesus had two natures, uh, both human and divine. And um, the Byzantines followed the diaphysite uh, creed, and they um, were really, in, they were oppressive towards the monophysites who did not have the same theological positions as the Byzantines. So when the Muslims come, they really don't care about this debate. Um, as long as they pay their taxes, um, they're able to worship freely. And so we find that um, uh, Islam expands into greater Syria and these regions with little uh, resistance. Uh, in, historically, sometimes this is referred to as the Pact of Omar, the different pacts that he makes in uh, this region of greater Syria. Omar is ascent, uh, eventually assassinated by a Persian slave named Abu Lu'lu, and uh, the motives are unclear. So after Omar, uh, Uthman ibn Affan, who was the son-in-law of the Prophet twice, he married Ruqayya and he married Umm Kulsum, uh, takes uh, leadership of the Muslim community. He was a scholar of the Quran, and when Omar was assassinated and he was on his deathbed, Omar formed a committee of people to elect the next caliph, and uh, Uthman was elected. He was caliph for 12 years, and Muslim sources often cite that Uthman had six good years and then he had six bad years. Uh, as Muslim lands expand, there are many political tensions that develop things that didn't that wasn't there before. Uh, Uthman names his relatives from his clan to uh, important posts in faraway cities. And um, in Arthman's uh, strategy, this was a way of putting people that he trusted in positions of leadership to keep the Muslim community together after Islam had expanded to such uh, faraway lands. But in the eyes of the Muslims themselves, many of these uh, members of Arthman's clans, the Umayyads, were not uh, regarded as pious and observant Muslims as those who served under Omar. So um, there's a lot of tension that happens in the Muslim community at this time, and um, a conspiracy develops in the lands of Egypt in which various factions try to take over and then claim Arthman gave them the authority to do so. And this included a forged letter by a relative of Osman who seeks refuge in Osman's home. Um, the rebels chase him. They come all the way to Medina and they enter, they break into Osman's home and they assassinate Osman in the process. Of course, there's a lot more details to each of these um, narratives, but I'm giving you all of this in a nutshell so that we can uh, move quickly in an hour and I can cover um, hopefully just the highlights of Sunni and Shia um, uh, similarities and differences here. So after Uthman, Ali ibn Abi Talib becomes the fourth caliph. Um, so he becomes caliph during a time of extreme tension and turmoil, as you can imagine. Uthman was just assassinated and um, there, there's a lot of 
conspiracies going on and people are angry. And uh, Ali decides for the greater good of the Ummah, the Muslim community, and keeping people uh, united, he decides against punishing the rebels that assassinated Osman. Uh, but a number of Muslims disagreed with this decision, saying that you can't just leave Uthman's blood on the ground. You have to punish those who assassinated him. They need to be held accountable. And uh, they gathered under the leadership of Aisha, Talha, and Zubair. And the Umayyad clan, who were the relatives of Osman, came together, especially Muawiyah and Marwan. So the, this, group, this group of individuals gathered together um, in a region called Bosra, which is close to Damascus. And what was intended to be a show of strength and a negotiation between the two parties became a heated battle. And this became known as the first fitna or the first Muslim civil war. It's also known as the battle of the camel because Aisha, who was um, leading this, uh, uh, this group, was in a uh, in a camel uh, in a uh, in a box that was on a camel. This is how um, this is how women traveled at the time. So um, this is the first fitna that developed. Um, Ali established Kufa in Iraq as the capital of his caliphate, uh, and Muawiyah refused to pledge allegiance to Ali. Now, there is a background here that you also need to be aware of in that even from before Islam, uh, pre-Islamic times, the Sasanians and the Byzantines were rival powers. So this is like maybe the Cold War with the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So the Sasanians and the Byzantines were rival powers in the region at this time. And among, uh, in the land of greater Syria, you had Arab tribes that were um, uh, aligned with the Sasanians. The Lakhmids, for example, were pre predominantly aligned with the Sasanians and the Ghassanids who were aligned with the Umayyads. And um, in these divisions was also trade routes that were, um, uh, that were prevalent at the time. So in diverting the capital of the Muslim lands from Damascus to Kufa, Ali was also diverting trade routes and uh, shifting economic uh, centers of power. So this was, um, this was met with great resistance by Muawiyah, who was, the, um, who was in charge in Damascus and those around him in greater Syria. Uh, when Muawiyah refused to pledge allegiance to Ali, they sent troops, and uh, this is what's known as a hundred days of negotiations. Took place with no agreement. Uh, things eventually became heated again here, and uh, you end up with a skirmish known as the Battle of Siffin. Uh, when Ali was winning this battle, Muawiyah's forces put pages of the Quran on their spears in an attempt to divert Ali's forces uh, to stop fighting, and this worked. And then both parties agreed to resolve the matter through arbitration. And then we talked about in the first session how uh, this incident, uh, from this incident emerged different sects like the Khawarij who were against arbitration and things of that nature. 10 months later, Amr ibn al -As, so now they're negotiating, right? So Amr, uh, so Muawiyah and Ali agreed to negotiate their terms rather than um, create further bloodshed. And uh, Muawiyah sends Amr ibn al -As as his representative. And Abu Musa al-Ash'ari uh, is representing Ali. Abu Musa by this time is, um, is an older man. He's a little bit perhaps maybe... Um, uh, um, not as um, not as um, he's a little bit naive in his interaction perhaps with Amr ibn al-As so he gets taken advantage of 
So Amr ibn al-As creates a ploy in which he tells Abu Musa that they must both agree to re uh, relinquish, relinquish each party's claim before they can start negotiations. So Abu Musa says, yes, sure. And he agrees um, and he says, Ali, he relinquishes Ali's uh, claim to uh, the caliphate. And then rather than reciprocating, Amr says, great, I accept and I nominate Muawiyah in Ali's place. So of course, Ali and his party, they feel like they were tricked because they were. And Muawiyah then refuses to accept saying, you agreed, you relinquished your power and I was nominated. So this becomes sort of a standstill situation in which Ali remains caliph in an official capacity and his power is centered in Kufa, which is in Iraq. But in Syria, Muawiyah remains regarded as the person in real authority. So in Syria and um, the clans that are aligned with the Umayyads there, uh, he, Muawiyah is regarded as the person in authority. When Ali dies, this conflict continues in which the son of Muawiyah, we're going to see and discuss in more detail, uh, Yazid massacres the son of the prophet, uh, the, the son of Ali, Hussein, as well as dozens of members of uh, the prophet's family at Karbala in order to remain in power. So we see the struggle between the Umayyads and um, uh, the supporters of Ali remains uh, even after Ali passes away. So at this point, you have Shiism that starts to develop as an alternative leadership model. It's at this point that you see this, um, a group of people that really come about calling themselves as partisans of Ali. Um, Shia means partisan of, and Shia saw themselves as partisans of Ali. Both Sunnis and Shias revere Ali. Shias, however, later in time, developed a theology in which they believe that the Prophet Muhammad had designated Ali as his successor. Um, and there are different um, schools of Shia thought, like the Ismailis, etc. But I'm only going to focus on 12 Rishism because of uh, we have a limited number amount of time. And this is perhaps the most predominant uh, school of Shi thought. So these are the 12 uh, imams of 12 Rishism, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Hassan ibn Ali, Hussein ibn Ali, Ali ibn Hussein al-Sajjad, Muhammad ibn, al ibn Ali al-Baqir, Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq, Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim, Ali ibn Musa al-Ridha, Muhammad ibn al-Jawad, Ali ibn Muhammad al-Hadi, Hassan ibn Ali al-Askari, and al-Mahdi. So what are some of the foundations of um, 12 or Shia beliefs or theology as it develops later on? So the first foundation is Tawheed, and there are four, four, uh, four aspects of this. The first is unity of divine essence, Tawheed, and that, and this is that God is one. Uh, he has no likeness. He transcends any uh, attribute of shortcoming. He has no form. He does not resemble his creation. So this is Tawheed, and that, the unity of God's essence. The second um, element of Tawheed is Tawheed al-Sifat. So she has adopted the Mu'tazilite position that God's essence is one with his attributes. And um, this was an important discussion from last week. Uh, if you missed last lecture, I encourage you to go back and listen to that, uh, the the Ash'ari um, Maturidi distinction differences with the Mu'tazilites on the issue of divine attributes. The Mu'tazilites, who were initially Hanafi, um, uh, over time, the, the Sunnis, the Hanafis, leave Mu'tazilism, and Mu'tazili, much of Mu'tazilite thought and theology becomes incorporated into Shi'ism. So uh, Shi'as adopted the Mu'tazilite position that God's essence is one with his attributes. Um, they also believe that the Quran is created and that God cannot be seen in the next life. 
and you can uh, refer to last week's lecture for more details on this. Uh, the third element of Tawheed for Shias is Tawheed al-Fi'l. And this is that there is no creator other than God. He has no partner, no guide, no supporter. He is not obligated to do any of his attributes of action. So bringing to life, causing to, uh, causing death, granting provision, forgiving, etc. All of this is done out of God's own will. Uh, the distinction between God's active attributes found in the 99 names is important. Uh, Muslims would never say, for example, that God is love. Muslims say God loves. So it's always in this active verb form. So God acts in certain ways. Um, this nuance has a significance in the ways uh, questions of theodicy are considered. God is not described as omnibenevolent by Muslims, Shia or Sunni. God is neither good or e nor evil. He transcends those. He is the determiner of good and evil. Um, but God is described by Sunnis as omniscient and omnipotent. So these are, um, he knows and he is all powerful. The latter are attributes of perfection, kamal, and the former, benevolence, is an attribute derived from a subjective judgment. What does it mean to be benevolent? What you might regard as benevolent may not be benevolent in another person's eyes. What does it mean that God is love? What is love? I mean, how do you define love? What love is to one person might mean something else to another person. So um, these attributes that come from um, subjective uh, categories are not uh, to be projected on God. And finally, uh, unity and worship, Tawheed al-Ibadah. So this is the fourth element of Tawheed in Shiism. And this means that one does not worship or pray to anything but God. Uh, one may not worship or pray to the prophet, an imam, an angel, a saint, etc. This is different from veneration. When they venerate, um, they're not worshiping uh, uh, an imam. The second foundation of 12 or Shia belief is prophethood. And this is that God sends prophets and guides them with re revelation, wahi. And this is similar to Sunni beliefs. Um, what differs is the question of infallibility of the prophets. So Shias believe in the absolute infallibility of the prophets to the point which they cannot err or they cannot be corrected at all. And this differs from the Sunni Shia of Isma, of infallibility of the prophets. So for Sunnis, Isma is uprightness rather than infallibility. So prophets are protected from intentionally sinning. They can err without sin um, or between, and if they're given two good choices, uh, a prophet may choose one that is less good, or they might not make the best choice. But this is, um, this is not, but they're protected from sinning. So this is um, a, a difference in Sunni and Shia belief about Hasma and what that means when it's uh, uh, regarded uh, when it's uh, applied to the Prophet. So for example, the verse in the Quran, Abasa wa tawalla in al a'ma, in which the Prophet frowned and turned away, the, the um, sabab and nuzul of this particular verse, the cause of its revelation is uh, in Sunni sources that Um Maktum, one of the blind companions of the Prophet came to the Prophet when he was in the middle of a, um, uh, involved discussion with one of the leaders of the Quraysh and that the prophet was hoping in speaking to him to be able to win his heart and be able to um, uh, bring people to the prophet's mission. And so when this blind uh, Sahabi came to the prophet asking him to teach him, the prophet turned away. And this these verses from the Quran were revealed as a corrective to the prophet Abbas Tawalla. Uh, he turned and he uh, he frowned and he turned away. But Shias would interpret this in a different way. So even this act of 
choosing something that's less good, frowning and turning away, or that the Quran would correct the prophet, even this is regarded as um, out of the question in terms of the way that they understand Isma and its application to prophets. Um, and the third foundation of 12 Shia belief is imama, which is religious leadership. And Shias believe that imams are necessary just as prophets are necessary. They believe that imamhood is a continuation of prophethood. Um, imams have a parallel status with prophets in terms of infallibility and divine selection. So either directly or by appointment by, of, by the previous imam. So if the previous imam is also divinely selected and has infallibility, when that imam selects the next imam, that that is considered to be um, a divine guidance. And this is a point of major difference with Sunnis who hold the status of nubuwa to be unique and incomparable to the status of an imam or a wali or anyone else, uh, uh, any other human being. So um, you'll see in, for example, Nasir al-Din al-Tusi and uh, al-Hilli and others will talk about imamhood as a lutuf or a benevolence from God and that it's necessary for God to appoint an imam. Uh, the appointment of the imam, according to Shias, cannot be left for everyday people to choose on their own, but the imam must be divinely chosen. Um, reverence towards and following the imam is obligatory and becomes a matter of disbelief if one despises the imam due to the conception of this imam's divine selection. Uh, this also leads us to the occultation of the 12th Imam. So 12 Rishiyas believe that the 12th Imam, Imam Mahdi, who was born in 268-73, went into hiding in order to protect himself from assassination. And um, the context here, this is really important to um, understand, is that the Umayyads and the Abbasids always saw the family of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, as a threat. They always saw the uh, progeny and the descendants of the prophet as a threat to their own power because they claimed uh, their caliphate, they claimed to be powerful as well because of their proximity to the prophet's clan as being Quraysh, for example, or that God had divinely chosen um, not that they were lawgivers of divine, uh, of, of sacred law, but that their position was sacred and revered and that God had chosen these caliphs to be caliphs. So the family of the prophet was loved by everyone. This wasn't a Sunni Shia division. Everybody loved the family of the prophet. Um, and there was a lot of piety-minded opposition as Marshall Hodgson calls in his book, in his series, Venture of Islam, that uh, really were unhappy with the Umayyads uh, based upon their lack of observance of Islamic practice. And so uh, both Umayyads and Abbasids saw the family of the Prophet as a threat to themselves and they, uh, the family of the Prophet, the members of the Ahlul Bayt were regularly persecuted. So. Um, the 12th Imam, Imam Mahdi, goes into hiding, and during this time until uh, 328, uh, so from 260 to 328, he was born in 260, after he becomes the Imam, he goes into hiding until 328, when he communi communicated with his community through four ambassadors, Sufara Arba. And this period is known as the Lesser Occultation or Ghaibat as sughra After 328, the Imam is believed to have gone into greater occultation, Ghaibat al-Kubra. And it's believed that he's still living and that he will return on the Day of Judgment, according to Shias, and fill the world with justice. Uh, in the meantime, in the absence of the um, Imam, 
uh, Shias have a, something known as a religious reference, which is marja at taqlid. Uh, so 12 or Shias believe that one must follow a religious authority known as a marja taqlid in the absence of the imam. And such a person often has the title of Grand Ayatollah. An Ayatollah is expected to have completed Shia seminary training at the highest levels, and Shia seminaries are uh, often known as Hausas. And um, he is supposed to have received permission to do ishtihad or engage in reasoning on religious matters that come up. So they have a long and rigorous training to reach the stage of Ayatollah, and they're selected for those uh, for, for that position. Ayatollah Khomeini was perhaps the most famous of this type of figure. You probably have heard of him in the Iranian Revolution, but other individuals um, ranked as Ayatollahs are Ali Khamenei of Iran, Ali Sistani, Musa Zanjani, and Sayyid Rouhani, etc., so these are all marja taqlid, religious references. The fourth foundation of 12 or Shia belief is the day of judgment, Mi'ad. So Shias like Sunnis believe that God will raise one back to life on the day of judgment. Uh, uh, they believe in judgment, heaven, hell, a space between the worldly life and other worldly goals will be waiting, known as the barzakh. Uh, much of this overlaps with Sunni beliefs with the exception of the return of the 12th Imam. There is some debate over what type of body will be erected. Is it just the soul that is erected or is it the body and, and the soul? Is it the same body that uh, the person had or will God recreate that body? So this is a, a topic of debate among Sunnis and Shias. The fifth foundation of 12 or Shia belief is justice. So uh, God is just, and according to Shias, God has no choice but to act justly. Uh, definitions of what is just are recognized by humans of a sound mind. So God acts according to these standards. She has adopted the position of the Martesilites in saying that humans create their acts rather than God creating all actions and that humans acquiring them as the Ash'aris believe in terms of caste or um, the uh, uh, humans being given free choice as the Maturidis believe. So this will be in the Theodicy lecture next week. And the sixth foundation of 12 Shia belief is precautionary dissimulation, which is taqiyya. And this is a concept predominant among Shias in which if one's life or property are in danger, then one may hide their Shiism or their religious beliefs. Um, and uh, again, if you recall that uh, the, sh the family of the Prophet was regularly persecuted in its early times under the Umayyads and the Abbasids, uh, and uh, those who followed them were regularly persecuted, you understand why this has become a part of their regular practice of taqiyya. So the Shia population around the world, Shias constitute approximately 10% of the Muslim population, with the remaining 90% or so being Sunni. Um, here are the top five Uh, countries in the world that has that have the largest concentration. The first is Iran, uh, Shia, and this is eight million people. Sixty-six million uh, is Shia. Been updated recently, so um, take this with a grain of salt. These are approximations. Pakistan has the second largest uh, uh, Shia community out of 212 million people, 42 million, 42.4 million are Shia in Pakistan. Iraq has a 65% Shia uh, population 
And uh, out of 38.4 million, 24.9 million people are Shia in Iraq. India has 1% of a Shia population, but out of 1.353 billion people, 13.53 million people are Shia. And then Azerbaijan is 75% Shia. So out of 9.98 million people, 7.5 people are Shia in Azerbaijan. So this is where the Shia population is concentrated around the world. So uh, some points of difference between Sunnis and Shias, I will go over a few. The first is the Ghadir Khom incident. What is the Ghadir Khom incident? So this is uh, the incident when a group of Muslims were camped in a valley upon area known as Ghadir Khom. The Prophet is said to have made the following statement. Whoever is my ally friend, whoever is my mawla, um, is also an ally of Ali. Love those who love him and disregard those who disregard him. There are various renditions of this, and this is just the basic content of the hadith. What this means is there are different narrations and that you might have um, different wording uh, uh, in the different narrations, but this is the this, the crux of what the contents of the hadith is. Uh, she has interpreted this hadith as meaning that the Prophet designated Ali as his successor at Ghadir Khom. And Ghadir Khom is celebrated by Shias as a day of commemorating this. And we see this uh, miniature here in which um, this is actually, uh, it looks like this was a Sunni miniature. And, um, and because the faces that were scratched out appear to be Abu Bakr and Omar and Osman. And then you see the image of the Prophet is depicted as designating Ali as his successor there. But um, I, I'm not entirely certain about the sources of this miniature. So um, we could explore that later. But this is quite interesting. So the Sunni view on the Ghadir Khum incident, and as we mentioned in the first lecture, the topic of imama is not a topic that is integral to Sunni theology, except as a reaction to Shiism. So you'll find that um, Sunnis will discuss these topics always in a responsive way. So they're responding to um, Shia, uh, certain Shia theological claims, in this case, that the Prophet Muhammad uh, appointed Ali as his successor at Ghadir Khum. So Sunni historians respond to this saying that the context of the hadith was that there's a sabab al-nuzul of the hadith or sabab al-nuzul is for the Quran, but the hadith has a greater context. And this is that a group of the Sahaba had camped at Ghadir Khum following an expedition to Yemen and that there were a number of new Muslims who maintained hard feelings towards Ali because of Ali's prevalence in his battles against the pagan Arabs. And that included many of the relatives of the new Muslims there. Um, And there was also some misgivings about Ali's dispersal of booty that they attained in the battle. So the context, according to Ibn Kathir and others, was that the prophet, prophet publicly praised Ali in order to mend the heavy hearts that were among some of these Muslims Uh, as they were traveling with Ali and the Prophet in Ghadir Khum. Sunnis also argue in later sources. So after Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, you find many uh, commentaries on his book, like Tasdid al-Qawaid. And there is another book here. This, um, This book is a commentary on the Tasdeed al-Qawaid by Sayyid Sharif al-Jurjani. And um, this was just published in Istanbul. And uh, the Ottomans and the Safavids really debated these issues thoroughly without using polemics, without disrespecting one another. And um, uh, you see this in the 
a genre of commentaries on Nasir al-Din al-Tusi's Tajrid al-Aqa'id. And so Sunnis write commentaries on Nasir al-Din al-Tusi was a Shia, his book Tajrid al-Aqa'id, and it becomes a source of uh, engagement back and forth between Sunni and Shia thinkers. And they do so based on rational arguments and using the forms of um, rational debate that we discussed in the first lecture. And so this is one of those texts. And um, there, there's another work that's coming out that hopefully will be out in the next three, four years of Ottoman scholars who wrote uh, maybe 16 different commentaries on Nasir al-Din al-Tusi's Tajrid al-Haqa'id. And um, we're looking at the section on imama and the different conversations that emerged from this. So, uh, so this, is where, uh, this is where we're getting this. This is from the intellectual tradition of Adud al-Din al-Iji, Sayyid Sharif al-Jurjani under the Ilkhanids, which then uh, gets passed on into the Ottoman intellectual tradition where kalam is studied uh, in this way using the aqliyat or a focus on rational uh, reasoning. So Sunnis add that there is no indication that the term mawla is an imam or a caliph. They argue if the prophet in saying that Ali is my mawla here, if the prophet meant that Ali was supposed to be caliph next, that Ali is supposed to be imam, then why didn't he just say that? Why would the prophet um, not have been explicit about something so important if that's what he intended? Particularly if this important thing is a theological issue, as she has claimed, the imamate, it would have been the prophet Muhammad's responsibility to convey this clearly to his com community as a part of his mission. Uh, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Arabi also argues that if it were the case that Ali's leadership was divinely ordained by God and the Prophet, Ali would have been in sin and transgression for not fighting to fulfill this command of him when Abu Bakr became the caliph. He argues that of all people, Ali would have been the most to blame in such a circumstance. So if the Prophet told him to do something and he just gave up and he didn't um, fight to do what the prophet um, commanded of him, then Ali would be at fault in this situation. Finally, uh, numerous Sunni sources, including Sahih Muslim, which is uh, one of the most authoritative books of hadith, cite the Ghadir Khum incident. Uh, if there was a mass conspiracy to uh, undermine Ali's leadership, as Shia's claim, then why did this not translate into expunging this hadith from Sunni sources? Why is this in Sunni sources? So this is, these are the arguments of the Sunnis, the responses of the Sunnis to, uh, to the Shia claims of Ghadir Khum. So we saw the context of the incident, as well as uh, these three rational arguments that I've listed here. And of course, if you read these texts, you'll find a much more uh, detailed discussion of these subjects. Another incident that um, is important in Shia literature and in Shia uh, theology is Fadak. So the Prophet Muhammad had an agricultural plot of land known as Fadak, uh, and this was a prosperous land in which there was a lot of um, uh, profit that was coming from dates that were planted on this land. When the Prophet died, the daughter of the Prophet Fatima claimed inheritance rights to this land. Uh, Abu Bakr, who was caliph at the time, did not permit that the property of the prophet be distributed as inheritance. He cited the principle, that principle that prophets do not inherit. They don't leave inheritance. They leave sadaqat. What is theirs belongs to the entirety of the Muslim community. And this is because they have a public and a holy role as a divinely appointed messenger and prophet. Having property and leaving property then would be considered a conflict of interest for them. 
Uh, the companions of the Prophet were in agreement regarding this matter. Fatima, however, did not agree with Abu Bakr's decision, and it is said that when she died six months later, she died with a heavy heart towards him. And this is another miniature here. We see that Ali is depicted as standing on the shoulders of the Prophet as he removes the idols from the Kaaba. Uh, we find extensive Shia literature is produced on this topic with lengthy poetic formulations of uh, Fatima's objections and the verses from the Quran that she cites and her bringing people together around her and making arguments in her disagreement with Abu Bakr. Shias cite the incident as fedak as an intentional slight against the family of the Prophet. So they, this is one of the incidents in which Shias argue that Abu Bakr had a personal, uh, uh, he was personally against the family of the Prophet and that he uh, prevented Fatima from her inheritance for personal reasons. Uh, among famous Shia works that detail the story as a literary genre are Ayatollah Ali Shubair al-Haqqani's Shah Khutbat al Sadiqa Fatima, Fatimat al Zahra. So let me repeat that Shah Khutbat al Sadiqa Fatimat al Zahra. So this is her khutbah that she gave, and he gives a commentary. There are also countless treatises and works carrying the title. <laughs> Kitab al Fadak. Excuse me, it's Ramadan and can't have a glass of water when your throat dries. Okay, um, there are two versions of the Fadak incident in Sunni sources. So the first version is that the Prophet owned a part of the Fadak property, which is about 150 kilometers outside of Medina, and he used to use the profits from the date crops of the land to support the Muslim community and its expansion towards the end of the Prophet Muhammad's life. When the Prophet died, Aisha, who was the wife of the Prophet and who would have been one of the inheritors of the property, along with Fatima and Hafsa and others said in a hadith saying, the Prophet said, we prophets do not leave inheritance. What we leave behind is sadaqah. Another version of this narrative attributes this to Abu Bakr saying this. So another version of the story states that after her father's death, Fatima claimed that the prophet left or gifted Fedek to her before he died. So if he gifted it to her before he died, it's no longer an inheritance, it's hers. So Abu Bakr asked her for witnesses. Uh, does she have any witnesses for this? And she brought forth Um Ayman and her husband Ali. Now her husband's testimony was disqualified due to the conflict of interest of him being the claimant's husband, and Um Ayman's testimony by herself was not sufficient to prove that the Prophet gifted her the pro uh, property before his death. So therefore, Abu Bakr cited the hadith above, we prophets do not leave inheritance, what we leave behind is sadaqah, and he made the uh, land of Fadak public property. Um, Abu Bakr is also cited as having been really meticulous about uh, how he used the property of uh, the Muslims and having been really fearful of God in his, uh, in the way he dispersed of property. And he was concerned about things like conflict of interest. So Sunnis differ with this interpretation that we talked about, the Shia interpretation that Abu Bakr intentionally slighted Fatima and he intentionally uh, took from her what was her right. Uh, if, we if we assume that the version in which uh, Abu Bakr did not believe that the prophet left the land to uh, Fatima as a gift, okay, by uh, making it public property, the Abu Bakr is still then harming his own daughter. So, say there's no proof that Abu Bakr, that uh, the Prophet Muhammad left Fedek as a gift to Fatima before he died, it's still the land of the uh, Prophet, it's the property of the Prophet Muhammad, which his own daughter, Haisha, would have been one of the inheritors of. So, uh, 
Uh, so we said here, I show the daughter of Abu Bakr and wife of the prophet would have been included among the inheritors of Fadak, even if the claim that the prophet gifted it to Fatima were rejected for lack of sufficient proof. If Abu Bakr's decision was based on ulterior motives to intentionally cite Fatima, his actions would have also not just destroyed, uh, deprived Fatima, but also Aisha, his own daughters. Uh, number two, all three of the subsequent caliphs, including Ali himself, the husband of Fatima, upheld the public property status of Fedak. Omar's daughter would have been another inheritor of Fedak uh, because Hafsa was a, another one of the Prophet Muhammad's wives. So if we say Abu Bakr rejected Fatima's claim that uh, uh, the Prophet gifted it to her, it's still the Prophet's property, which would have meant that both Aisha and Hafsa, as the wives of the Prophet, would have had a claim, the daughters of Omar and Abu Bakr. Uh, Omar did not reinstate this land to its inheritors or its so-called inheritors when he became caliph. Even more importantly, Ali did not write what Shia's claim was an injustice when Ali became caliph by giving Fadak to Hassan and Hussein as their rightful owners. And then uh, third, uh, I believe this is here. Hold on. Okay, I'm going to get to this third point. Uh, here, the third uh, Sunnis argue is that the historic evidence then lends itself to demonstrate that the companions of the Prophet, including Ali, were in agreement with Abu Bakr's decision. Uh, this reflects the view of Sunnis regarding infallibility and theodicy. So Fatima and Abu Bakr could have a difference. Aisha and Ali can have a different opinion. Uh, they could have a fight, they could have a war, they could have a difference. Uh, one can be more correct or one can be wrong while still remain pious and good and worthy of reverence by Muslims. So, um, you know, ironically, Sunnis are not uh, on the side of Haisha, Sunni texts you'll find, are not... Uh, when they look at the difference between Aisha and Ali, they will say they both had a valid uh, point, but that Ali was more correct than Aisha in this situation. And you see this is a, it's a typically Sunni way of regarding these conflicts in a much more nuanced way where one side is not good and the other side is bad, but that two good people can differ they could have differences of opinion and remain good people. Two people could have a conflict and remain good people. Uh, and so, and this comes from not believing in infallibility of individuals uh, and even, uh, okay, yes. And so this differs in their understanding of, of infallibility. So if, uh, for example, uh, in Shia thought Ali is infallible, then anybody who differs with Ali is automatically uh, wrong. Whereas if one sees both parties as exerting their ishtihad, as exerting their what they believe to be right, they are still good people because they're doing what they believe to be right. And one can say later on that Ali was more correct in his beliefs of what was right than Aisha, but they're still two very good people. And this is how Sunnis regard these differences. And then the, uh, the final objections that Sunnis have of, uh, to the Fedak uh, narrative is that Sunnis argue that the Shia narrative appears to be formulated to depict Abu Bakr in a bad light. It vilifies Abu Bakr. In doing so, they argue that it also depicts Fatima in a bad light through mischaracterizing her as being overly attached to material wealth and property. Rather than accepting Abu Bakr's ca cautious approach to the personal distribution uh, uh, of the prof to the distribution of the prophet's property to uh, uh, public, uh, making it public property, and uh, rather than keeping the upper hand and giving Abu Bakr the benefit of the doubt, her holding a grudge against Abu Bakr until her death, 
uh, Sunnis argue is not in line with Fatima's noble character, and this doesn't depict Fatima in a good light either. In other words, uh, Sunnis regard much of these narratives to have been later fa fabrications that were added to evoke emotion in the listeners to feel partial to Fatima and by extension to the Ahlul Bayt and then disdain Abu Bakr. However, in doing so, Sunnis argue that Fatima is presented as a person, as a materialistic person who is overly concerned with inheritance properties rather than the well-being of the Muslim community after the Prophet Muhammad dies. If you recall, in early Islamic history after the Prophet Muhammad dies, the Muslim community was really fragile and people did people were afraid that Islam would not continue after the Prophet died because people were there were differences and there were uh, those who refused to pay their zakat and the and Abu Bakr had to uh, uh, engage in the Rinda wars against them to keep the Arabian Peninsula unified. So for Fatima to uh, be willing to endanger the unity of the fragile Muslim community after the Prophet Muhammad's death for the sake of material wealth is a narrative that is just untenable for Sunni. So these are the objectives, objections that Sunnis have to the way uh, this incident is depicted. And you'll see that both Sunnis and Shias will have really strong um, uh, feelings about the way these incidents are portrayed. So let's look at Karbala. This is another point of uh, both overlap and difference actually between Sunnis and Shia. So what happened at Karbala? Uh, uh, there's a lot that we could say in detail, but we're not going to go into detail because we don't have time for that. Relevance to this era, the troops of Yazid massacred the family of the Prophet Muhammad, his grandson Hussein, and they massacred 77 of its great-grandchildren and grandnieces and grandnephews. Sunnis and Shias do not differ on whose side they're on. Both Sunnis and Shias are on the family of the Prophet's side in this situation. They're both on the side of Hussein. That should say Hussein, not Ali in the slides. Uh, what differs is how Sunnis and Shias view the theodicy of what happened as well as how they mark the event. So to claim that Sunnis are on the side of Yazid or that Sunnis are with the Umayyads is really not, uh, first it's not distinguishing between the way Sunnis uh, uh, separate between political power and religious power and so uh, they don't see the Umayyads as spiritual leaders the way the Shias might uh, be, have seen the family of the Prophet as both political and spiritual leaders. Uh, but it's also misrepresenting Sunni Islam if we say that Sunnis are on the side of the Umayyads and Shias are on the side of Hussein and the Ahlul Bayt. Both Sunnis and Shias are on the same side on this. Uh, what differs is how they interpret this event. So for Shias, the incident of Karbala takes on a theological significance. It becomes a yearly remembrance and commemoration, and it becomes a central part of Shia practice from then on. The emphasis on mourning and sadness also becomes a distinguishing feature of Shia thought in which this tragic incident becomes a source of communal ritual mourning, and um, this becomes a, uh, a common practice in Shiism. Sunnis do not believe in ritual mourning or defining their theology of these tragic events. So this is another, this is where the difference lies among Sunnis and Shias. Uh, this has been misunderstood by some to mean that they are either insensitive to the tragedy or Karbala or they are on the side of Yazid. This is not true. Uh, the Sunni perspective has been to hold one's head high and not show the enemy one's tears. So this mourning and crying 
um, it actually makes the enemies of the family of the prophet, it gives them more confidence, it gives them pleasure to see that they inflicted this pain on their enemies. So Sunnis don't show this pain uh, publicly. And there's also a sense of comfort in viewing uh, the incident through the lens of positivity and that they were martyrs. And that at the end of the day, everything that happens, even tragic incidents happens with God's knowledge and with God's will and that um, uh, at the end of the day, that uh, these individuals are martyrs and will be raised as such on the day of judgment. And being a martyr is a uh, is a joyous occasion. Uh, being a martyr is a source of joy. Um, this is why, for example, uh, uh, Rumi on his death date, they call many call this his wedding. So this is the date in which he uh, reunites with his Lord on the day of his death. So death is viewed differently uh, in Sunni uh, in Sunni thought. So this is a simple summary, and we will uh, discuss this a little bit more. But um, this is an interesting miniature here you see in Qajar, Iran. This is a Qajari uh, painting, and um, this is Hussein. You see him uh, killing his enemies and being uh, courageous in battle. And you see the many different uh, incidents of what happened in Karbala depicted. It's almost similar to the, uh, what do they call it in Christianity, the points of the cross. This is interesting. It would be interesting to really look at the similarities between how uh, these two are depicted, some of these incidents uh, in Shiism and in Christianity, particularly in Catholicism. Uh, this is, uh, these are the gatherings of Muharram. So here are some pictures of Sunni uh, Shia ritual practices that uh, mourn the events of Karbala. This is in Iraq. And it's customary practice to put this, uh, this flag or this banner on the dome of the mosque during Muharram. This here says, yeah, Hussein. Okay, so um, another point of difference and similarity among Sunnis and Shias is how they conceive of leadership and continuities and continuity. Um, for Sunnis, Isma, so this should actually say infallibility, so Isma. So for Sunnis, Isma, and I don't want to translate this as infallibility because Sunnis don't define Isma as infallibility uh, per se. So for Sunnis, Isma is in the larger community. Sunnis believe that God protects the entire Ummah, the entire Muslim community, from agreeing upon an error, error. So being a part of a the larger Muslim community is essential for Sunnis rather than um, breaking off from it as uh, Shias uh, will claim that they're breaking off and having Shias being a part of the uh, party of Ali. For Shias, Isma or infallibility rests in the figure of a divinely guided Imam and the community must follow this imam. For Sunnis, leadership is acquired through merit, piety, knowledge alone, uh, rather than something which is inherited within a biological lineage of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, there's no clergy system. An imam in a mosque is just someone who leads the prayer. He is not necessarily the best person in the community or even the most knowledgeable. And there's no ordainment of religious leaders in Islam. And this also then translates into uh, leaders of the Muslim community, the caliphs. They're not 
um, necessarily the most pious person. They're not the most knowledgeable Muslim leader, but they know how to um, govern and they know politics and they know uh, the skills to keep uh, a country or a, 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 um, a land running. They didn't have countries at the time, right? Okay. So theocracy is actually antithetical to Sunni Islam. So the equation of the caliphate with theocracy is really um, a misnomer. So in, in a theocracy, the leader who is, uh, is, makes the laws and it's a top-down uh, model, but the leader makes both the religious and secular laws, the religious and non-religious laws. So the political leader is an imam, and they make both religious and secular laws and impose those on a people. That is how a theocracy works. This is not how Sunni leadership structure is. Okay, I've also illustrated this again. So it's a top-down model. If we made this arrow vertical, you see how that would work in a theocratic model. This is antithetical to Sunni leadership structures. Uh, divisions of power in Sunni political and uh, religious leadership is, is a separation between political leadership and religious leadership. So you have the people, uh, the common people, the common Muslims, and you have their religious leaders. So a religious leader, because there's no clergy system, a person be becomes a leader of a community by first studying, learning, and being um, recognized by their peers of scholars, of teachers, of people of knowledge, as well as being recognized by people. So somebody who's a scholar but doesn't have anyone who is willing to follow them and endorse them is not going to be able to be a leader, regardless of how many years they, uh, they spent studying uh, religious studies. So uh, people recognize their religious leaders. They uh, follow their religious leaders based on their piety, based on recognizing in them the behaviors that they ex expect of religious leaders, uh, pious behaviors, ethical conduct, these kinds of things that, uh, uh, that people view and uh, expect of religious leaders. So so you see on the left, it's a circle. So religious leaders endorse other religious leaders and they also become endorsed from the grassroots up. Those religious leaders that have been both endorsed by their peers and their uh, congregations then create religious practice. Then they make comments and give opinions about religious practice and guidance. Whereas the uh, political leader is a top-down model in which the leader, the sultan, the caliph, creates secular laws for governance of the, uh, let's just say, uh, nation, for lack of a better word, the empire, the community, whatever. And uh, that those laws of governance then become applied to the greater uh, citizens of that land. But also remember that you're dealing with people who are living in a decentralized system of government. So the political leader did not have the power to impose, uh, uh, to micromanage, let's say, because they're, uh, because of the nature of pre-modern societies. Uh, for scholars, you also find the Awqaf system which is uh, uh, found, uh, Al-Qaf uh, are religious endowments, sorry, from Ramadan Fog. So uh, Al-Qaf are religious endowments and uh, they provided economic independence to religious leaders from the state. And uh, John Walbridge writes about this in a chapter of his book, God and Logic in Islam. Uh, religious leaders exerted some influence over rulers and at other times were feared because the power that they had in influencing the people who loved religious leaders. Uh, an imam is not a, the religious 
Imam is not the religious leader. Political leader is not the Pope in Sunni Islamic thought. So Imam here meaning the Caliph is not the religious leader. That should say the Caliph is not the religious leader and the Caliph is not a Pope in Sunni Islam. Um, governments were decentralized and thus embraced diversity and tolerance when the Ottomans attempted to centralize the empire. So you see in, under Sultan Abdul Hamid, you see that when the, uh, the they tried to centralize the empire, it collapsed. So uh, modern extremist groups like ISIS and others are in fact a mutation of modern political systems. So they're copying modern nation state systems and modern uh, systems of national identity rather than going back to some Islamic sources they claim. Uh, Sunni Islam historically separated between religion and politics. And this is different from seeing the role of the caliph as sacred. So yes, Muslims saw the caliph as fulfilling a sacred role in his uh, governance of Muslim societies, but that caliph did not create sacred law. He did not create religious uh, practices for Muslims. He did not judge in religious matters. He judged in political matters. And that act of judging in political matters in itself was regarded as something uh, sacred, as worthy of reverence, as worthy of, uh, of respect because of the sacredness of that amana or that trust. So this is a distinction here, a nuance that uh, that we need to keep in mind. This is a good book I recommend. I think it's chapter three. You might want to look at that. So we briefly mentioned this concept of isma or protection in Sunni and Shia perspective. So this is another point of difference in Sunni perspective, isma, or sometimes translated as infallibility, but more appropriately, uh, the word is protection in Sunni contexts, is uh, that the entire community is protected. So the Ummah of Muhammad, the entire Muslim community, is protected from agreeing on an error. Hence the concept of ijma'ah in Sunni Islam having a, uh, a status of uh, having a, being a source of religious uh, law and practice. So this is the idea that uh, uh, Sunnis believe that inf infallibility or protection from error is in the entirety of the community. Whereas for Shias, isma or infallibility is with the individual imams who are from the lineage of the prophet and are selected divinely either directly by God or through the Lord and that uh, following them and why a position to follow them. I'm almost done here. Uh, in practice is perceived through the chain of individuals with what is often known as charismatic authority. So this is uh, the Shia, a Shia perspective of what we discussed earlier um, was a, a, a Sunni perspective. So this is how Sunni saw continuity of Islamic religious practice from the time of the prophet to the present day and how they viewed politics and, uh, and theology. And they separated between the two. Uh, in uh, contrast, in Shia tradition, continuity and authenticity of Islamic practice is seen to go through a chain of individuals of what is often known as charismatic authority. Mar uh, Maria de Cake has a book on this I highly recommend, an ex excellent book. This is the idea that the imams have a charismatic authority. Uh, for Sunnis, continuity and authenticity of the authority of the proto-Sunni network of Hadith scholars create a narrative of continuity from the prophetic tradition onward through the system of Isnad. So for Sunnis, you have a community of scholars, uh, of teachers, who in, in the early phases transmitted all of religious knowledge in the form of Hadith before religious knowledge became divided into different fields like theology, Hadith, Tafsir, 
tasawwuf, fiqh, usul al-fiqh, kalam, etc. Before that, in the first century, everything was narrated in the form of hadith. So this is different from the Ahlul Hadith. Uh, so uh, the successive chain of dominant scholars who are affirmed by their peers and the people who verified their piety. Uh, they are regarded in the proto sunni consciousness as representing, preserving, and transmitting the perspective inherited from the prophetic period and play a decisive role in the formation of Sunni Muslim identity. And uh, this is evident in the life of Ibn al-Mubarak. So this is what, what I'm saying here is for Shia's continuity comes through the, peop the person of the imams and then later the marja'a taqlids, whereas for Sunnis, it's a community of scholars who pass on their knowledge to a community of scholars, to a community of learned people, et cetera, et cetera. And those communities are uh, in uh, volumes, known as biographical dictionaries, and they're organized in tabaqat, and they're also uh, 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 preserved in what's known as isnads, or chains of transmission. And uh, personal piety was a part of being included or excluded in this, in this group. So, for example, certain groups that were seen as heterodox were excluded from the group. Um, and piety, having a role in the acceptance or rejection of an individual as a early hadith transmitter, also indicated that Islam was uh, not just a set of rules, but also a spiritual way of being in which piety was a foundational aspect of the philosophy of Islam. So somebody who was good at memorizing hadith but did, was not a pious person would not have their hadiths accepted. They would not be uh, included in this circle or this community of scholars uh, that I that I mentioned here. And um, this is just a touch on my work. So I write about this in more detail in my book on the emergence of early Sufi piety and Sunni scholasticism. Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak and the formation of Sunni identity in the second Islamic century. So you can uh, look at a much more uh, in-depth discussion of continuity and authority in Sunni Islam in my uh, book. And that's the end of my presentation. I know that this was a lot. Uh, I hope I didn't super confuse you. Uh, I hope you got some things out of this. No problem if you missed a lot of things, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Absolutely. There's a lot of for uh, the really insightful presentation. Again, uh, Dr. Feria, I don't know how you're able to compound 1,400 years, 1,300 years of, of tradition, of uh, you know so much insight and historicity um, into into just within the hour. So mashallah, uh, may Allah preserve, preserve you, yeah, enable us to continue to benefit from your knowledge. Um, and uh, I've been getting a, a lot of questions in the chat, and I think especially um, uh, uh, with respect to some of the earlier material that was discussed, but no shortage of questions. And just a reminder to everybody uh, attending, um, please uh, do feel free to just Drop your questions in the chat, either sending it to uh, Muslim Space or to myself, uh, and we will uh, get to them as much as we can accordingly. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'll just go in order as these questions were received. So, uh, Dr. Ferial, the first question is asking, uh, why did the Muslims choose to expand so widely? I was taught as a child that it was to spread the word of God. When I read and listen to words from the academy, the impression I get is that the expansion was to gain uh, wealth. Taxing non-Muslims was a major source of wealth to the central Muslim government. Which one is it, uh, in your opinion? Um, I don't think it's either one. I think it's both. So there was a political uh, element to a expansion and that expansion maintained a source of income that helped keep uh, uh, the, the Darul Islam or whatever, it helped keep the uh, community uh, functional. Um, and the people in those areas were not forced to convert. Uh, they convert much later on to Islam. So, so it's both. There were those who had 
different motivations. If you were the caliph of the Umayyad empire, then you had a different motivation than say if you were a pious religious figure like Imam Abu Hanifa, who was, uh, who's, uh, whose intention was to teach and spread Islam. So there are different people in, in, in the community. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, the, the next uh, one pertains more specifically to uh, kind of the historicity and the derived theology that, that comes about from the events of Karbala and, and, and so on, the development of Shi'i theology. The question asks that, do the majority of uh, Shia Muslims, uh, at least 12 or Shia Muslims, accept this version of history that there was one community, then there was the horrific massacre at Karbala, uh, and then the development of Shi'i theology, or is this kind of the Sunni version of uh, explaining that development? Um, that would be, so the Shias would say that from the beginning, the Prophet Muhammad appointed Ali and that there was a conspiracy to prevent Ali from being caliph uh, and uh, so on and so forth. But um, this would be not just a Sunni perspective, but it would also be, I think, a more academic perspective in looking at how many of these ideas evolved into Shia theology later in time, and they were back projected. Um, and I presented some of the arguments why um, that would be problematic. So if Ali was supposed to be the caliph and the prophet told him to do that, why didn't he fight for what he was told to do? And he would have been uh, wronged if he didn't do that. So, uh, so the perspective that this is a later back projection is certainly not the way Shias will present uh, the development of Shia thought. However, um, uh, the uh, questioning of that narrative is based not just on ideology, but it's based in academic, rational um, rational uh, reasoning. Thank you. Uh, the, the next question uh, lifts up that uh, in incidents like that of Fadak uh, or of Saqifa, uh, which are uh, also mentioned in uh, like Sahih Bukhari or other Sunni sources, what do you feel is like the wisdom uh, that was uh, that was put into including these um, if they were either perceived maybe uh, as fabricated or being able to be perceived as, uh, you know, giving different um, uh, different conclusions that uh, were, were different from the intent? Um, or was this a perception of this perception of fabrication, one that was of later scholarship um, that, that was projected onto those classical sources? Let me see if I understood your question correctly. Sorry, it's Ramadan and we all have a little bit of brain fog. Uh, to totally understand, uh, no worries at all. Yeah. Um, the inclusion of these narratives in Sunni sources, Hadith sources, uh, I think demonstrates that there is not a conspiracy to hide these things. So if there was a conspiracy to hide that the Prophet appointed Ali as caliph, and then all of these Sunnis went and hid that, why would they have included it? They would have expunged this stuff. So the inclusion of different narratives in um, Hadith sources, in Sirah texts, in um, the inclusion of these early incidents of disagreement and conflict, I think really reflects the confidence that Muslims had the, a confidence that I think is lacking oftentimes in the modern era, but early Muslims had a confidence in uh, being able to keep all of these in the history books and in uh, historical reports without needing to, um, uh, to censor things or give a clean, uh, a clean version of history, like everything was pristine, everybody, elected Abu Bakr, there was never any difference of opinion, they never disagreed with one another. I think that gives, it lends more veracity to the sources themselves, because a, a, a narrative that is um, a, hagiogra um, a hagiography only depicts things that are good, and, it and it's presented in a way that is intended to evoke uh, an, an emotional attachment to a particular narrative without questioning any uh, pos possible differences that could have occurred along the way.
I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the second part of the question is more just in, in, in a historical sense, uh, when we look at certain nuances that come with these events or how, how certain things are read into them, um, whether certain things happened or not, uh, the question of them then being labeled as fabricated or this, this evaluation, does that generally come more in like a classical period a few centuries later? Or do you see these coming up a little bit closer to the, the event itself, or is that more kind of classical scholarship looking back and saying, well, these don't really add up, so this is most likely fabricated in a sense? Yeah, so I mean, I really didn't spend a lot of time on fabrication at all in the in the narrative, so uh, in, in what I presented. So in Hadith scholarship, there are certain criteria in which Hadiths are accepted or rejected for fabrication, one of them is if you if a hadith appears to be disparaging a group of people or if it appears to be overzealous, et cetera, et cetera. But I really didn't bring that up at all. That was not the premise or the basis upon which um, uh, I said Sunnis differ with Shias. And I think that's really a straw man argument of what Sunnis believe is to say, oh, Sunnis just think it's all fabricated. We don't. And so we don't have to think about this any further. Um, even the FedEx incident in which I said, uh, I, I gave five different arguments that Sunnis will bring up for this, uh, this incident. And uh, the, uh, the claim that this appears to be fabricated was number five, but it's based on a rational argument in that how is it that you're basically saying that the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad is more concerned about inheriting money and wealth than keeping the Muslim community unified. How is that even in any way, um, how does that make Fatima look good? How does that, that doesn't, that's that's out of, uh, that's out of character of what we know of Fatima is what the Sundays would say. So that's what I presented was a rational argument as to why they would find that hard to believe. It's like, if you know, if I know you, Osama, and then somebody comes and tells me, do you know that Osama said such and such? I would say, well, I know Osama. And that sounds really out of character for him to have said that. And I have a hard time believing that because of his uh, record in X, Y, and Z and having said that. So um, it's really not just uh, Sunni saying the or Shia saying this happened and Sunni saying no, it's fabricated. But it's a much more nuanced and rational um, engagement with Shiism that I hope I was able to convey in this in this in this lecture. Sure, and that that was very helpful, Dr. Ferial. And and just a reminder to uh, the audience, the attendees, and people watching later, uh, and to our questioner that. Uh, the not just the recording, but the slides, inshallah, that Dr. Ferial shared um, will be a part of that recording. So feel free to definitely go back and uh, you know look at this and all and all of its nuance, but also uh, unpack it uh, in that sense. So thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Ferial. Um, the uh, the next question we come, uh, I think, came up uh, when you put up the picture of uh, the incident of Karbala. You know, the the the, the kind of uh, uh, I, I can't remember. I think you said the the uh, the Khalid, not Khalid, the Hajar period. Yeah. Yeah, Hajar period. There you go. Painting, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, the question was that in discussing Karbala, uh, I couldn't help but notice, and as you mentioned, some parallels to Christianity and maybe more specifically Catholicism uh, as you were discussing it, um, and seeing that with respect to uh, modern uh, Shi'i practices of passion plays like Ta'zia. Um, the stations of the cross or different, uh, you know, parts of uh, that that whole narrative. Uh, any idea uh, if there was an exchange or influence uh, of traditions between these two groups or how they may have come to have such a close overlap? Was it maybe coincidence? Um, that's a really great question. It's a question I also want to explore further. But I also see those overlaps. Also, the um, the veneration of saints and the veneration of imams and things like that. They're very, there's a lot of similarities in practices between Catholicism and Shias. Passion play there. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, um, and it's, it's fascinating that and then compare it with Catholicism, yeah. 
definitely definitely yeah no no and i think uh how you, you mentioned, mentioned that, that and i'm, I'm just uh, sending you a, a few of the questions there so that you have them as well um, as I'm going to be asking them, but some of them are a little bit larger. This one, I think I sent you a shorter one, um, but uh, there's a question here that says, uh, assuming it's safe to say that Islamic theology has largely been shaped by the political history and military conquests, how do you think the theology would differ had Islam not spread so far outside of the Arabian Peninsula so quickly after the Prophet Sallallahu death. In other words, do you think the trajectory of Islamic theology would have looked different if it was more deeply rooted in governance over a majority Muslim community versus having been developed in majority non-Muslim lands with leadership preoccupied perhaps with power, control, and expansion? Well, um, the question seems to have embedded in it the implication that um, theology was created by Muslims and that uh, there were theological beliefs that were um, that were added rather than ways of discussing, ways of debating, rather than questions that were asked and then rational engagement with those questions. So, you know, if you were uh, in Medina and you never left Medina, you probably don't need to um, think about whether the Quran is created or not, or in liberation, and whether the uh, Quran to Muslims is like Jesus to Christians, etc. You don't need to think about those is issues, sure. But um, the conversation came with uh, diversity, but um, the belief system didn't change. It was just how they uh, defended, so to speak, or how they uh, engaged with other traditions that was enriched rather than um, uh, uh, diluted or changed by uh, engagement. Does that make sense? Uh, that makes sense. And uh, if anybody needs clarification, again, please feel free to uh, to use the chat. But no, that, that definitely does. I like how uh, you mentioned it wasn't a, a unique thing that had come out. It was also um, a, a product of interaction and, and not just yeah. something that Muslims came up with at, at one point. So I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, if anybody has any clarifications, please do drop it in the, in the chat. Uh, the other one I just messaged uh, to you there, Dr. Friel, before this more recent one that I was just asking, uh, that do Shia imams uh, engage in ijtihad more liberally than Orthodox Sunni leadership, or do, Sun, uh, do Sunni theologians consider the gates of ijtihad closed? That's a really uh, common um, stereotype of Sunni Islam. So um, the assumption here is to put um, modern, some, uh, some practice, some modern thinkers as juxtaposing Shia thinkers. So Shiism is more rational and Sunnis are not rational. But um, if you, when you study the intellectual history of Islam that does not have a lacuna after the Abbasid period that looks at how philosophy and rationalism continued uh, within the uh, Sunni Islamic tradition after Fakhreddin al-Razi through uh, the Ottoman period, you see that um, that's actually not true at all. And that uh, uh, there were always uh, liberal readings of Islamic texts have always been there from the beginning and have always continued. But in the modern era, you have some movements um, you have in Saudi Arabia, you have certain thinkers and movements that really see uh, uh, see themselves as representing orthodoxy, but really this their ideas are a divergence from mainstream uh, Sunni practice, but see themselves as representing orthodoxy and and reason. And then those who want to uh, uh, project these two individuals like Iran and Saudi Arabia as being two parties in opposition to one another, one representing Shiism, one representing Sunni Islam, whereas in terms of Sunni Islam, that, that would be quite far from the truth. Thank you so much for 
that answer, Dr. Ferial. And the last one uh, here is is just a rehash, um, uh, and, it, and it will be in the recordings as well. So just to uh, let, let folks know, asking a question. Um, but uh, could you uh, please uh, lift up the names of the books that you mentioned uh, yes. in your presentation today? Yeah, so, and this is connected to the question that came before. So how do we know that Muslims engaged in philosophy and Sunnis engaged in rational thought? Is our Shias rational and philosophical and Sunnis are literalists and, you know, that's not what the intellectual tradition uh, um, This is uh, Nasir al-Din al-Tusi wrote Tajrid al aqaid <clears throat> and um, he uh, brings up points of metaphysics and he, do he talks about the oneness of God, but he also brings up many of uh, a lot of Shia belief, uh, points of Shia belief, including the uh, imamate, imamology. And the Sunnis respond to this in many books, but uh, two books in particular, Tasdeed al Qawa'id by uh, Mahmoud ibn Abdurrahman al Isfahani. And then uh, there is a Hashia, a commentary on the Tasdeed by Sayyid Sharif al Jurjani. So these are really the stars of Kalam and Islamic rational thought in the Sunni world that really continue this, uh, this tradition of uh, liberalism in terms of how you read texts. And so Fakhreddin al-Razi, his students, Adud al-Din al-Iji, Sayyid Sharif al-Jurjani, Taftazani, uh, Ali Kushju, all of these individuals continue from the Ilkhanid period all the way through the Ottoman period. Um, so Tasdeed al-Qawaid is uh, one of these books. It's in Arabic, of course. And then there is a Hashia on the Tasdeed by Sayyid Sharif and Jorjani. And there are other books here. So for example, this book, Sharh al Mawaqif by Sayyid Sharif al Jorjani. This is a copy, um, a Turkish copy in which uh, you have the Arabic text and there's a Turkish translation, which you can ignore, but it's a beautifully written uh, Arabic text in which Islamic uh, theology, philosophy, imamology, all of these ideas were engaged in. What else do we have here? This book I believe is Ali Kushju's. Yep, Ali Kushju, so he was a scholar under the Timurids, and then he came to the Ottoman lands. He also uh, wrote a commentary on Nasir al-Din al So these are some of the names there. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Ferial. And again, for folks, if y'all uh, weren't able to write those down, uh, again, the recording, inshallah, has those, so feel free to pause there. Um, but we have Dr. Ferial, inshallah, for one more uh, session, uh, inshallah, next week. Um, where we'll be wrapping up this uh, this series. Uh, that's there. Thanks so much, for Dr. Ferriel, for, for putting that uh, in the chat. Um, and yeah, so if there's any questions that did not get a chance to be answered uh, this uh, this session, please do tune in next week. Um, we can go ahead and uh, answer them as well there. Um, and yeah, you, uh, I was just messaged that you can rewatch this session as well as all previous sessions um, on YouTube uh, under Muslim Space. So if you feel like you haven't been able to catch up, no worries. Um, we have that uh, there for everybody. So inshallah, um, we'll, we'll be seeing uh, Dr. Ferial next week. Uh, is there any kind of uh, preface or any preview you would like to give us for next week, Dr. Ferial, and anything to prepare beforehand? Yeah. So next week, I'll be talking about theodicy and qadar, qada and qadar and free will and these types of subjects. So if God is all powerful, um, do humans have free will that's independent of God's will? If humans have free will, does that limit God's power? If God wills that everything happens, then how is God a just God? If he has predetermined what you're going to do and act, and then he's going to punish you for it. So we'll be looking at these questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferial. And shall we'll see you all next week uh, for, for what's going to be a great conclusion to this series, but uh, also um, really looking forward to a really relevant topic that each of us uh, somewhat, some way think about in, 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 in life, I think, especially in this month of Ramadan. Uh, but Jazakallah khair, uh, Dr. Faryal, I'll see you and everybody else uh, next week then. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for having me.
Absolutely. Selling everybody. <laughs>